So good afternoon, everybody. So nice to see you all. I see some very, very uh, familiar faces here. So thanks for coming and being with us this afternoon. And uh, we are going to talk here about the object. So that's when you walk into the salon, you see objects, and there are so many objects. What are we doing? What are we looking at? But um, we are going to talk about the object as a, an engine of transformation. And I'm having an amazing panel here, and I would like to introduce them one by one. Uh, first of all, I want to call Nazi, Nazi Najad, please, Nazi. Uh, Nazi is a New York City-based art advisor. She's a creative consultant and a writer. She was born and raised in Tehran, which I found like fascinating. Uh, do you go back there? No. Um, because she was born in the wake of the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War and moved to America as a very young child. How old were you? We left Iran and actually, um, as refugees, I went to Greece um, in Athens. So that's where I spent my um, kind of childhood and then came to the States as a preteen. Okay. It's been a while. Um, so Nazi is um, the, the, whole, I, the whole notion of trauma um, and the power of art as an engine to, uh, for social change really have been central to her work and her identity and her writing. And she's living with historic design from the 60s. And that's what we're going to talk about. So thank you. I want to introduce you to Dr. Frank Moore, who is a neurosurgeon. And he is specializing in brain and spine surgeries. He's also an associate professor of clinical neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Hospital. Sorry. But he's a very long time collector of contemporary art and mid century design, and among the pioneer collectors of Jean Prouvé and Charlotte Perrian in this country. This was really before the scholarship and the market uh, were fully developed. Uh, so, Frank's passion for the object and for living with good design historical design, defined his aesthetic choices, and shaped his living spaces. Is that right to say? Yes, it is. Thank you. I want to introduce you to Brian McCarthy. <clears throat> uh, Brian is an award-winning interior designer and collector who founded his firm 30 years ago. Uh, in his commission spaces and residences across the globe, he's known for combining art and collectible design. His knowledge of both areas have led him to become an educator for his clients, uh, and his long passion for collecting art and design of various periods have turned him into a connoisseur. We're going to talk about his collection of Claude Lalanne. So thanks for being here. And I'm just going to take my clicker because I want to show you the homes. And you can see that the homes are very, very different. But there is something in common between them is the passion for the object and how they are willing to invest time, resources, and their lives into this. So. These are, this is Brian's apartment in uh, Midtown West. And um, I'm going to, sorry, sorry. This is his apartment. And it's filled with uh, masterpieces of historic and contemporary design, as well as contemporary art. Uh, this is Nazi's apartment in the East Village. Is that correct? In the East Village. And she is, um, she loves living with historical design from the 60s. We're going to talk all about that. And this is Frank Moore's apartment in the Upper East Side. And you can see, of course, now we can see with this amazing image, your preference and aesthetic sensibility. 
So I want to ask you, Nazi, you told me something about when you got married, you met your husband. What did you tell him? <laughs> Actually, and incidentally, he just walked in. Um, so I, I truly love design, and I believe that it's um, an important part of one's life. And when I first met my husband, and when we started maybe getting a little serious, wasn't even that serious, I, I said to him, if this is to continue, um, I wanted, you know, you would think we're asking about other life matters. I said, if this is to continue, I need to understand that you will live with minimalist 60s <laughs> design <laughs> and that this is the only way we can live. And if this is a problem, um, I don't know if this, you know, I don't think we should continue um, this path. <laughs> is he here? He is here. He's in the back. Where are you? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question later. Okay. So, Frank, you told me a long time ago that even before you achieved your enormous success as a surgeon, design became really important for you. Can you say something about that? Yeah, I think that um, design was just something that came naturally because even as a, as a surgeon, during the training, you kind of get respect for certain aspects of the anatomy, of the body, and that respect just transpired to every objects of every day. And, um, and I think in that sense, I wanted to be surrounded by um, things that I thought were beautiful not only because I wanted to live with the respect of the object, but also coming back from work, I wanted to have um, a place that was peaceful and something that would provide me with, uh, with a relief from every day's work. That's why he's here. And Brian McCarthy, you, when was the time that you, trans, you, when you started working as an interior decorator many years ago, uh, it was very customary to work with antiques. When was the time, the point where you moved from antiques to de start developing passion for 20th century design? Uh, well, I started at Parrish Hadley, so I came from a very traditional background. And, you know, I'd, I would say decoration 40 years ago was a bit time stand still, and I was not someone that was standing still. And so it just became this very natural evolution um, uh, developing interests, seeing things, being very curious about the arts. And actually, Lalonde was the first, like, trigger for me that really took me to the other side um, and made me a crack addict. So, <laughs> so I see art and design as really, um, I, I can't imagine life without it. I know. Well, all of you. So um, that's your home. We're going to get to it soon. Uh, Nazi, tell me about when do you, you know what I really love about your collecting is that you collect things that are very affordable, and it really demonstrates the idea that you can live with good design, with good historical design, which is extremely affordable, and I would say even more affordable than if you go to the store. So, tell me what uh, what do you like about design? What is your area of interest? Um, well, personally, I, I'm really interested in the power and politics of aesthetics, and I believe there is um, there, there, there's a real connection between um, one's inner life and inner home and inner mind and the discipline that's required to kind of bring it to an absolute. And um, so for me, that's why radical designs and minimalist designs and kind of the change of um, at the turn of the century was so important for me. And so that's why for me it's so important. I can't really imagine um, being surrounded by any other kind. And so I believe, um, and also I love what the designers did. So in kind of researching them and getting to know them is really what has become important. And to your point about the affordability, um, it's actually, it's funny to mention that because good design does not have to be extremely expensive, um, but I do think you should really look into what it is you're getting and um, 
sometimes that's really what matters, is to actually like look for pieces that are historically important. And if we look at this desk, for example, so this desk was uh, produced for, a, it was very industrial, it was produced for offices yes. by Olivetti, and it was designed by the brilliant, brilliant studio BBPR in Milan in the 60s. Do you, f how do you feel about having uh, like industrial, object at home very comfortable <laughs> very nice I, I really appreciate it i love industrial design i mean our space is quite um it's actually our space is quite raw in that we will do work to it but the furnishings and the design is kind of how we we live with um and this desk especially um it was based on the office products that olivetti was first producing and it was, um, you know, Olivetti, what I loved about um, kind of Olivetti is that they, from the 1930s, believed in, um, you know, collaborating with brilliant designers to kind of create other designs. So I think from my understanding, they were probably one of the first to do that, where now, you know, these kinds of commissions and collaborations, we, we see it much more often. And so this um, particular desk is um, metal rods and plastic, and the cover, you know, the top is treated with um, kind of leather and made to look like wood. Um, and it's quite practical, but also it's quite beautiful and comfortable. And I think that's the thing that, I, that matters to me is the um, craftsmanship. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Frank, this is your home. And I want to ask you about um, your love for Charlotte Perrion and jean -Paul. And when did you learn about them? And do, are you still... Are you still loving it in the same way, living so many years? Well, luckily, I, I learned to love it a long time ago when it was still affordable. And so, um, probably not affordable for me today, but the idea is that um, you know, I wanted to have a place where the objects would be reflected pretty much through the apartment. So we tried, same way as we do for contemporary art, to focus on one or two or three designers. And then when you walk from one room to the next, these objects kind of walk with you because you're entering, you know, you leave a little, you can see in the background those little stools by uh, Perillon, and then you walk into the other room and then you have another table by Perillon. You have that beautiful bibliotheque in the back. And, um, and the same thing goes with lamps and so forth. So. The idea of focusing on one or two or three artists, um, I think, makes the home a little more interesting because you you enter a whole universe that the the artist or the designer wanted to provide and project to begin with. So you're entering their world and you can live within their world. That, that's really interesting. You know the 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 bookcase that you have. Can you see it? Where, oh, you see it here. Okay. It was designed by Charlotte Perrion, but in a little bit later time, it's it's a little bit more refined, more elegant than what she did before when she worked for student housing in the you know in the early fifties. And what I want to ask you is whether this is something that's important to you, it matters to you, where it was designed for. And the reality is this object I bought at the uh, Magen H Gallery, and I just fell in love with the piece. I didn't really think too much about the, uh, the historical aspect of it. And once again, because I have other objects that predate it and post-date it, it just is part of the continuum. If I only had one piece, then yeah, I think you would want to be very specific about all the aspects of it. But if you're going to have many different pieces, then they all relate and speak to each other one way or the other. I see that you chose this chandelier for your... Is this also, is this like a new, like, um, branching of your collecting, or how... how so, so, yeah, so lighting it is a whole different dimension, right? And um, I wanted a light that uh, unfortunately, the New York City apartments are not as high as you would have it back in France where I grew up and so forth. So I wanted a light that was going to disappear in the wall, but at the same time have a relationship with the 
the furniture that was around. So when I saw this, um, I, I went for it. As you can see, the one we have is not the bronze patina. It has that uh, anodized silver patina, which I like it because it makes it disappear even more. I mean, great, fit, great furniture disappears, basically, in my mind. Okay, that's a uh, really, really interesting concept that I love. Brian, this woman made a difference in your life. Oh, yeah. When Claude. did you meet and how this is oh, happened? Gosh, uh, I met Claude over 25 years ago, and it was through Jean-Gabriel Mitterrand in Paris um, when he was on the left bank, so it was before he moved. And I just, the, the minute I saw Claude and FX's work, it had such a, an impact on, on me to the point where I couldn't imagine my life without it. And fortunately, back in those days, it really cost nothing. And even then, that was a real struggle for me. And I had to, I mean, the first thing that I bought of hers was a pair of crocodile consoles. And I had to do, a, and I'm big on layaway plans, by the way. So I did a one-year layaway plan, and Claude produced way too fast. And I was like, wait a minute, you're ahead of me. But it led to this um, really getting to know each other over the years uh, and leading to several really interesting commissions. And um, we just had a very, even though she didn't speak English well and I speak next to no French, we just had something that you didn't have to communic communicate with words. And I also, just to talk about it even as a collector, although I don't really like to refer to myself as a collector, um, is the instinct which that I felt for their work when I first saw it. I knew if I missed that opportunity, I would regret that for the rest of my life. And so I think that's a very important component to if you're interested in collecting, um, is that gut feeling. And, and also being patient with yourself in giving yourself the time to really have the opportunity to look at many things and then occasionally you're going to pull the trigger quickly, but um, but you have to learn. And this is this is the other beauty of collecting over a longer period of time. Did you meet her husband as well? I never met FX. No, he was never. When I would go to Uri to their house, he was never there, and she was always there. And she'd have tea or coffee and something to eat, and she'd arm in arm. Um, you know, you'd walk through the garden. And I took several clients there over the years. And of course, all the things that she did, well, which wasn't many in this country, but any of the dinners in Paris. And of course, then two years ago, the big show at Versailles, which was very exciting to see their work in that context. So, so you worked with her on commissions. We see that. And I just wonder, what was it to work with her on commission? How much did she, was she willing to take from you or to put her own? Oh, I didn't, she didn't take anything from me, except when she did a chandelier for Danny and me in our apartment, and I said, I don't want a lot of birds. I love your butterflies. I don't love your birds. But in the case of this project in Switzerland, um, I mean, I had no doubt. We had designed a room, and she did the staircase and railings and this huge chandelier and 16 wall lights and a bed and, I mean, all these things. I didn't need to give her any direction. She was, you know, she was on it, and she... Because we had this wonderful um, sort of connection, I knew I'd get her best. So you also curated a show on Claude Lalanne uh, at Kasmin. And what did you bring into the show from knowing her? Well, I, it was very important to me because most people did, have never had the opportunity to go to their workshop studio. It's a, basically a group of farm buildings. And I really, Paul, who was a good friend, had done these photographs of her, of their house. And they're very revealing of them and the period in which they lived and how immersed they were in this kind of surrealist way of thinking. And I really wanted to give you that sense from the show. And then we did this um, background of sort of trees, which was actually, God rest her soul, Maria Perguet, who had shown me a maquette years ago for a dining room that she wanted to do for a client in the Middle East. And I, it never left me. And so when, when I was asked to curate this, I had the idea of just this background sort of being this, you know, forest uh, 
So that yeah, was... Yeah, I, I, lo I love that show. So you, three of you spoke about your passion for objects, but I want to ask somebody else about what type of collector are you? Is it okay for you that I'm going to the audience and ask? Okay, thank you. So we learn from people who worked with you. So where is he? He left. Okay, so where is he? Okay, so what type is what type of collector is your wife? What how passionate she is? Uh, there's definitely no shortage of passion. I think it's driven by passion, but I would also say that Nazi is very disciplined. So once the passion in a specific aesthetic is kindled, um, she is very focused, very disciplined um, in getting from the passion to the object that satisfies that passion. So I, I would say that discipline is what I admire about Nazi because as we, you know, sort of hit on something that we both like and then start to explore it, um, she's the one that always weeds out all the stuff that I sort of research online and show to her. And I think that's, that's an important aspect of it. So driven by passion, but disciplined. So now, um, okay, so now I'm going to ask you about Brian. <laughs> what about his husband? <laughs> can I say about Brian? What's the question? So Brian is somebody who does not accept the sort of aesthetic or, or value um, hierarchy, I think, that's out there. And he really goes with his own eyes to everything, whether it's architecture, whether it's a piece of, it's an object, whether it's a painting. He really comes fresh. It's very unusual to see that from someone who's so steeped in the world of clients and, you know, communications with, with the world and commerce and, and getting jobs done and, and sort of all the practical things. He really comes with like a fresh, fresh eye to everything. So I, I spend a lot of time with him looking at art, even though we're both pretty much our day jobs are design. <laughs> but. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a really rare ability to, to be surrounded by so much knowledge, years of, of looking, and to like look at everything fresh and have no hierarchy, whether it's a chandelier or, a, or a, an object. Thank you, Jennifer Olshin from Friedman Benda. <laughs> so, what type of collector is Frank? Frank? Yeah. Uh, a hard question to actually fill. He, <laughs> he's, he, uh, Frank, I would say, is somewhat eclectic in, in, and is super specific, and yet somehow the, the word eclectism comes to mind. He, he, he loves a lot of things, um, and yet, um, as I mentioned, he's, when he, he goes for col collecting someone or something, it's uh, it's very much in depth. So, so, so do you know, like, when you bring a new material, do you know if he would like it? Do you know his? Very, very much so. Yeah, he has a very unique test. So you know, you know that you you would say, "I, ah, Frank, I think this object might be of interest for your collection," and um, usually I'm right, or you know, most often. Good. So thank you. Because uh -huh. I want to hear from other people how you are as collectors. Uh, okay, now uh, let's go back to our slides. So, Nazi, I brought this sofa. Do you want to tell us? It's, it doesn't look very comfortable. <laughs> is it? Yes. Um, so, so we, is... we, I just want to ask from the three of you, is comfort a... Is comfort a... Is, this, is, is comfort like a, 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 an element in your choices, Frank? 
Yeah, you know, ultimately it is uh, when I'm talking about a sofa or anything like that. But it it boils down to um, function. A form follows function, basically. You know, to me, an object, whether it's industrial or a home object, is going to have to be able to to be functional. It's we're not living in a museum, you know. So there are kids running around. There's things happening. There's a dog. There's so, yeah, you want to be able to live with it. So comfort, you know, the light sound dimmers, the, uh, yeah, there is comfort. You've got to go home and feel really like it's a special abode. And that means it has to be somehow comfortable. But I'm not looking for something that's easy, but it has to resonate in a place that brings peace and tranquility. Brian, what about you? Oh, has to be comfortable. I mean, it's got to function. Everything, for me, when for us or for clients, everything serves a purpose. That purpose could be just a beautiful object on a table, but the table has to serve a purpose. And the relationship of things in a room, um, there's a structure, the way I see things. I also started with Albert Hadley, who was very much a modernist and very much sort of a frustrated architect. So, you know, from my years working with him, I sort of adopted that principle. Um, and Parrish Hadley, I mean, it was, you know, uh, absolutely function over form. So it's essential. So, Nazi, is it comfortable? Yes, it's definitely comfortable. Um, this is a Martin Visser um, BRO2 sleep sofa. And it was, um, Martin Visser started working with Spectra, I believe in... Um, in the late 1950s, and this was designed in 1960, the BRO2 sofa. And it's quite a, a, an engineering design feat in that in one swoop, it transforms into more of a sleep sofa. And um, it's a, you know, it's around, you know, the, the rods, and that's it, that's all there is to it. And it's quite, um, it's, it's, it's truly the form, the function, the engineering, the, the, the the, the, the efficiency of it, the slickness of it, it's all quite beautiful. And um, by the way, as I'd mentioned, because we'll be, we're actually going to be doing work to our apartment, some of the pieces are there in different places. So for now, this is in our living room where it's actually the day bed is going to go into the library. Um, but so it, it really is, you know, this is why I love the button. And Martin Visser specifically, not only was he um, an incredible um, Dutch designer and considered one of the greats, but he's also, he was also a prolific art collector. And approximately 400 pieces of his work um, are have been, you know, donated to museums. And his work, you know, his that's really why I was drawn to him, and why the it goes back to your point about the kind of the industrial nature of it, but it's still livable and comfortable, and it has it's part of a piece of history. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes, sure. Because it's so, sorry, it's so interesting for me. You know, it's, it's not my thing per se. However, it's so important to look at the big picture in this, in, in context, to understand, um, you know, how we go through these different periods and these different movements. And so it's so exciting to see this, and it's how I learn, and it's how it makes the whole process of, of seeing that much more enjoyable and exciting. So Frank, I have to ask you about Charlotte Perriand. I heard once when we did the movie for your friend, uh, the late Jay Chung, told me that you evaluate the table, not just financially, but I mean aesthetically, by the size of the, by, by the, by the, by the thickness of the of the top, is that correct? Yeah, Yours is very thick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that the great thing about furniture is you're going to touch it. You know, sculptures you can touch, but the uh, furniture you're going to be repeatedly using it and so forth. And uh, Charlotte Perriand was trained as an architect, and her tables manifest that, that skill, and they're built like, like houses. And um, 
So I, I like the idea of a house with a big roof and a really solid, and, and it's almost like a temple, you know, when you, when you look at those. So the thickness is, um, is the manliness of the table, and the formally or the shape that goes with it is more the feminine aspect of it. So uh, in that aspect, I, I think the thickness has uh, something to, to do about it. Yeah. You know, what I find really interesting is Charlotte Perriand. She started her career in the office of Le Corbusier in the 1920s, and she was responsible for creating this furniture. And, um, and once, she, once she left him 10 years later, or 11 years later, she immediately moved to wood, and she immediately moved to create those free-form tables. And what is the free-form table? Why is it like important? In, in this case, I think she... Not, no, or, uh, there's just any of her free yeah. form. But when she started with this, she was trying to accommodate this difficult angle in her apartment. But then I think from there, she realized she liked it, and then she went on. You know, so, so I collect both um, Rouvet, who is much more austere and straight, and then Charlotte Perriand, comes with these shapes that are so much more feminine. I think she had to distinguish herself from all the Corbusiers, Prouvés, and Jeannerets that were surrounding her. And in that respect, coming in with a, uh, with a fluid sh shape and a forme libre is something that, that would make it authentic for her. So I think that's... I see that's some examples that I brought here, a couple of examples. Uh, this is yours. Um, you're never going to give up on this one, huh? You, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the idea behind a table like this is it's, it's not just the, um, the object itself. It's its surface, the patina of it, how it reflects the light. I like this one because it's honey-colored, and I had a choice of maybe buying a black one at some point and replacing it, and although... Collector-wise, the black one is more desirable. I like the fact that it reflects, you know, the sunrise in the morning, and it's just an environment, once again. You kind of live through what the artist and the, and, and the, the designer had planned to begin with. It's very poetic, the way that you look and talk about design. Uh, but there was also something about democracy when she made these tables, because remember at that time there were like female furniture and male furniture and she was she was in a quest to create something unisex what about the democracy about of that shape that you don't have you know that people sit around without i mean the interesting thing also in the you can see the detail here by the way on the side you see these little uh cut ins, those are, that's the architectural side of her that takes over and, and any time the table is thick enough you want to reinforce it, so these are reinforcement plots that go through. And you can see the way the legs are built, you can, a lot of people can sit around it without having their legs or feet being encumbered, so it's also very functional, once again, form following function. Brian, you're home. <laughs> I was just there last night. Uh, Lalan has a strong presence in your home. How, what is your like, uh, conversation with those pieces? Well, I think what's inter what, what was particularly interesting about Lalan 25 years ago is nobody understood where it fell. Was it design? Was it sculpture? What, what was it? And um, you know, for me, I also love surrealism, although you don't see any of that in the apartment in terms of art, but I love, I love the craziness of that moment. So it does sort of embody, um, you know, coming out from that. And, um, and I, love, I love nature. I love the animals, which was, well, the two of them. Um, so I love, I love the softness of the form. I love what it represents, uh, that, it, that it's, uh, you know, it has a human component to it that I think is very beautiful and, um, you know, and it's in bronze. I don't really worry about it, except if somebody puts a wet glass down, I might, you might get a little, you know, a little 
you know, eye roll or nudge or, or otherwise. This is actually an old photograph of the apartment um, from years ago. So you also did, you, you did the last commission of Claude Lalanne? Well, she did, no, she did um, something for Cheval Blanc uh, after, but so this was this project in Switzerland that I worked on for many, many years. And um, this room, you know, was, uh, you know, I couldn't have done this room without Claude. This room would not be the room it is if Claude Lalanne had not been in my life to work with me on this, so. It was a joy. You said for many years. Can you say more about that? Well, the project went on for many years. I mean, when I, I sort of inherited this concrete bunker, um, it's half, more than half of this, these two chalets, it goes underground. So it's essentially, there's a landscape that never existed because it's all built on concrete that we worked with Wurtz on the gardens. Um, so... There was a lot of complexity to it and a lot of time, and my client was actually going through a divorce. So there were different moments where time stood still, and it just took a while. But in the end, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing, I think it's an amazing project. It is an amazing project. Here we see a couple of, and, and I want to say that those images were never published. So, right, it's the only way yeah, we can no, see them. Yeah. Never publish. Okay, Frank, when you sent this to me, I said, are you moving away to a different direction? When did you buy that? You know, I have one of those also. You know, you know it, it's, um, again, as we mentioned earlier, lighting and having different objects that follow you through the, through the apartment. So I got excited about uh, Werner Panton quite a while back. Um, I love those colorful balls they, they, he makes where you turn on the light and the whole room goes into a whole different state of mind and mood. So this one, um, I like the three-tier. I love the fact that it connects the ceiling all the way down to, to the floor. And once again, it's, uh, it's a light that emanates but also receives. So there, it's a... Um, glittering surface that shines and it also moves um, but it it's very austere it doesn't it's not in your face so once again it it can disappear if you don't want to look at it too much and what do we see here and so you asked me for objects of every day so then this is what I gave you because I I think objects don't have to be you know these big big pieces of furniture so I use these objects uh, like to put these shoes on today, I, I used the shoehorn from Karl Auerbach uh, design. And, and objects follow you, you know, in, in every aspect. What, what you use as a knife and fork on a daily basis probably resonates a little bit the rest of your day. So if you can surround yourself by objects that have, you know, a certain weight, a certain luminosity, then that's just going to make you a more comfortable person or a better person, I would say. Okay. Nazi, the last object for you. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, yes. Jenny Boeri is one of my favorite female architects from, the, from Italy. Jenny Boeri is just, she's spectacular. She's one of the few, uh, she's Italian and one of the few women to really push the boundaries of design and architecture. And just and has always been known for her elegance and power and beauty in, in, in the way she created. And she's quite known for her, um, the, the modular sofas that she's designed. Um, and, the, and I'm going to get to the Kubota one second. And um, her ghost chair, which was a later year, which was quite beautiful as well. But yeah, here that she's sitting on. And um, I, there was an interview by her in her amazing voice where she said the reason why she made it, and this is in 87, was that um, she just got so tired and bored of all of these, like, I think couch commissions she was getting maybe. And she's like, what if I made a chair that you just don't see? And it's made of a single sheet of glass. And I think it just captures who she is as a person. So I quite love it. Um, but going, and then um, one other thing that she did is um, she made these, it's called Sibi. Um, whiskey glasses that were in the Blade Runner movie 
and again, going back to your point about objects and why objects matter, but again, here you have this amazing woman who created such a slick, futuristic um, object that you know Ridley Scott thought it was the only thing that could represent in the film. So all of that, but going now to Kuboto, which is from 1968, I believe, for Artflex, and while her modular sofas and the ghost chair and even the Sibi collection became quite more mass produced and known, the Kuboto is really, really rare. And the ones with the drawers is a little bit less rare, but really the bar that we have is probably among some, one of the, you know, the rarest pieces she ever did. It was never fully mass produced. Um, and I just, not just love her and loved what she represented, but I loved what this design piece is, because it's so slick and I don't I mean, to say cute is not the word, obviously, but it kind of is, and it just um, it's precise. You put you can put a lot of things in the bar. There's a drawer. It's slick, and um, it took quite a while to find it. I saw a photo of it in um, a German architectural German edition of Architectural Digest, and I was just blown away. And frankly, it was quite over stylized. So you really had to look for this in that spread, and I think it took another seven eight years to find it through um, a source I have in Italy, and it was just no looking back. It was, it was quite, so it's probably my favorite, um, and they're all my favorite, but that one is kind of more my favorite. And, and looking at this sofa, it's just showing how a visionary okay. she was, Ginny Boeri. So I would like to uh, take a couple of questions from you, if you have anyone, any questions? Our oh, speakers, yeah. Who are you asking? Oh, I think I, the story is so much a part of it because, um, you know, I view the homes, well, I, view, I view our home, but I view all the homes as a scrapbook. So it's all about being on a journey and life is this long journey. And if there's a thread that connects everything. And I could walk you through my apartment and I could tell you the story of every single piece, where and when I bought it. Um, and what it means to me. So it's, it's, for me, it's critical. Any other question? So on this note, I would like to think, oh yeah, here. One? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I would like um, Frank's furniture, which I think <laughs> may have gotten away from me. So we can start with that. <laughs> And I would like the Lalan. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a trade. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I don't, um, well, I don't, I don't balance it. There, there is, I wish there was a balance, but I, I see it in the same lens because the, 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 the modernist furniture or like the, the kind of the, the radical European furniture at the time, they were quite radical and quite contemporary. And even now the ideas behind them, some of which going to the gentleman's point about stories are just fascinating because you can really get into a deep dive. And actually with Olivetti, there was a, there's a book that I haven't read yet, but it's about kind of this conspiracy that the CIA stopped them from the first computer and kind of um, murdered possibly. I mean, it was, it's, it's quite radical, but there's, there's so many stories, right? So I don't see actually a lot of difference in that the ideas are the same, the ideology is the same of what those works stood for at that time and what the contemporary artists of our time stand for now and with contemporary art it is also my profession and so what that is valuable to me is they're all of and as you and you know this um you, you're a friend and you've been to my home that every piece of art 
is a direct relationship with the artist. Either I've worked with them or I know them or it, so obviously I couldn't do that with the design, but it, it's almost like it fulfills the two sides or the many sides of my brain, but that's kind of. Can I just say too, I think that the art has a life of its own. And so by moving it, you know, it's, it's always interesting when things get moved in the apartment. People come in and they say, this is new, I've never seen it before. It's been here for 15 years, but it's, it's moved to a different place. You've curated a different group of things. And that's also the beauty of the time that it takes to collect and then being able to move things. I'll just say that the, uh, the furniture, the modernist furniture, really matches well with contemporary art because they don't fight each other. Yes. And you're not trying to bring art that is going to fit the sofa, obviously, but whatever work of art you put next to, um, you know, modernist furniture, breathes very nicely. Yeah, and... I'll pick the jaw-dropping one because I always have to smile because we have contemporary art, which is what it is, and then furniture, which is what it is, and we'll have people come in and not even see the furniture, right? They're like, oh, this and that and everything. And then I'll have a guy who comes in and he gets on his knees and looks under the table yeah. and he's like, I've never seen this before and so forth. So there's a world for everybody out yeah. there. I, I agree. Actually, there's a great story because there's another couch that we have that is not here. It's a Greta Yalk couch, and she's a, a Danish um, designer from the 50s. And a friend came over. He's, um, he's a musician and a DJ, and he's from Denmark. And all of a sudden, when I turned around, he was on his knees, kind of under the couch, like all the way, with quite tall. So his, I was like, where did he go? And he was looking at it because he hadn't seen one, I think, since... Maybe a family member had one when he was growing up. So I think those who kind of seek it um, will, will respond a certain way. And actually, opposite of that, if it's not something that you're generally interested in, but you see it in someone else living with it, then you can ask the questions or just kind of look at it. And I think that's also great, because that's how I feel. I feel quite curious. And I'm very blessed in that I have a lot of friends with really amazing homes <laughs> that I hope I keep getting invited to, but I love to see how others also live with pieces that I wouldn't necessarily know about or, you know. So thank you, Nazi, for being here. Thank you, Frank and Brian, and to you, all of you, and have a great afternoon.